All right, so I'm making a video here. I got a lot of information to pack into this, but I'm gonna try to make this as short as I can. So the topic on this is uh, some, some facts and some conclusions around this idea of uh, a change that I think has to happen in the world. Historically, uh, good women waited for good men to find them. And I think we're at the point for various reasons where that's got to reverse. So uh, the title of this could be Where All the Good Men, but actually I, I think I'd say something like Why Quality Women Have to Learn to Approach Quality Men. So um, I think I live a pretty insulated life these days, which I'm, I'm very happy for after being in the trenches of modern culture for maybe 15 years uh, being either a student in college or a professor at a college. And uh, I'm very happy to be out of that now because it was a train wreck and it was really obvious year by year to see the, the uh, clear degradation of society in uh, the coming generations. And just over that window, it was very plain that that was happening, but even in my um, hermitdom, I still uh, get wind of comments from many people, whether their parents or uh, the people themselves, asking questions about how to find someone worth being with. And uh, that's a valid question, it's quite important. So um, it turns out that in spite of the number of men complaining about the lack of women worth dating and marrying, there are women out there who are very good people who are available, um, but these men cannot seem to find them. And so if you reflect on, on why that's so hard, it's really not a mystery. So historically, where would people, where would men go to find women? Well, you could go out in some social setting. Um, I mean, people meet each other at bars and things like that. But just like bars, what you'll find is that these places today, um, they're probably the last place you'd expect to find a quality person. In fact, wise men and wise women would not pick people up at bars. Um, and then there's been this mass exodus to dating apps, which have degraded to hookup apps. And again, wise people would not be on those apps. So um, where would you find people? Well, what about at work? And if you're unfamiliar with this, I suggest you hit the internet, but it is uh, wide, widely believed now, and I agree with this for a whole lot of reasons, that you should absolutely, positively, if you're a man, never ever hit on in any way any woman at work. In fact, you should ignore them as far as you can while still doing your job. And you should only interact with them when you're around other people that include men. And there are reasons for all this. It's not the point of the video. The point is, if you're a quality woman and you're expecting that at work or at school, you're going to meet some quality guy, it's not gonna happen. Statistically speaking, and I'll get to that, it is not gonna happen. So what does that leave? Well, if you're a guy, where are you supposed to look for the women? You don't have an option. If you're a woman, you're not going to get hit on by quality men in all of the places that you are during your daily life. I mean, if a quality guy was looking to meet quality ladies, just about the only thing he could do is get a part-time job working someplace where he's going to find, uh, interact with people that he's not working with. And that means retail. And I say a part-time job because that can't be your full-time job if you're a quality man because it doesn't pay enough. And because of that, a quality woman will not take a man seriously who's got a job at a grocery store or gym and uh, unless he owns either of those two places. Uh, so, so 
that woman is not going to accept the advances from a guy that works at those places just because in all logical reasoning, he's not up to her standards, right? So what does that leave? It's a huge problem. So um, let, me, let me tell you, let's see, um, the good news. So, so let's start with the bad news. The bad news is good men are exceedingly rare. I'm about to tell you some statistics and they're gonna shock you if you're not already aware of them. Um, the, but the good news is they're really, really easy to find. And that's a shocker for you if you've tried, but I'm going to tell you how you're doing it wrong. So let's start with the statistics. Um, we're gonna hit some scriptures here too, so that'll be fun. So um, right now, if I were to ask you, if you're a young woman, um, what, or any woman actually these days, what percentage of men do you think meet your standards? Now, I don't care what your standards are for, these, for the intent of this question. Um, you probably have a pretty high number compared to actuality. Now, I happen to know that for various reasons, but let me prove it to you. So you should go on to, there's a website. I'm not doing a screen share today. So there are several websites where people have compiled census data. So it's not their opinion, it's hard data. Census data on uh, various attributes, various variables that people think about in terms of their standards for the opposite sex. So there, there are websites for guys and there are websites for gals. So if you're a woman interested in men, you should go to igotstandardsbro.com. That's, these guys obviously have a sense of humor, but and I can almost guarantee they are in fact guys. But there are various other ones out there. You just Google um, quality male probability calculator or something like that. igotstandardsbro.com. And so what they have, they have, you can punch in anything you want. What I punched in was, so I'm not a, a person interested in, in men, but um, if I were, I just kind of took a stab. I said, not married. Uh, I, did, I did constrain it by race just for the heck of it. I said, not married, white, at least six feet tall, not obese, and earning at least $85,000 per year. And I thought that this probably reflected what the standards of a whole lot of people are, a whole lot of women are. And frankly, um, I agree with the not obese and earning at least $85,000 per year. I think those are very good standards. And I'll, I'm about to give you the statistics. But before I do that, I want to say that, you know, a guy who's obese and a guy who's not making $85,000 a year uh, the likelihood that they have something to offer you that's worth contracting marriage, it's like zero. So it's not zero, but it's pretty dang close. And, and why do I mean that? Well, um, the obesity thing, that's completely preventable. And it's not just a physical thing. It connotes some serious problems with a whole lot of internal things that are gonna come out in a whole lot of other ways. But a man who can't control himself is extremely limited in the good he can do for the woman he's with. And what about the money? A lot of guys get really upset when women start asking questions to try to figure out how much money they make. In my book, that should be a leading question and rather than be offended, I would, um, I mean, yeah, the lady could be a gold digger, sure. But rather than be offended, I mean, I'd kind of expect that question. Why wouldn't you, right? Um, because it turns out it's massively important in terms of the kind of life you can have, how many kids you're going to be able to afford, you know? So why wouldn't you ask that? It's, it's a very close uh, surrogate to try to estimate the, what that man can provide for you in life. So anyway, these are not high standards, these are like baseline, I'd say, right? Um, I, not the race one, but I just punched that in because I figured that a lot of white girls are probably only interested in white men. But what do I know? Because I'm not a white girl. Okay, so anyway, 
So not married, white, at least six feet tall, not obese, and earning at least 85,000 a year. What percentage of men do you think meet that criteria in the US? 0.37%. So, um, oh, and I didn't mention age range 20 to 40. So that's still a wide range because I think most young ladies 18 to 25 would not put their top range at 40. It's 0.37 for 20 to 40. If I go back and I lower that, let's see if I can do that. Let's say 20 to 30. Whoop. Everything else is the same. This is going to be fun. 0.20%. So, that's pretty bad. In fact, they have a little infographic for the probability. I'm going to show you. <laughs> All right. Can you see that? So, this is like the population. There's two little dots out of all that. I don't know how many dots are there, but you can do the math. Okay? So, the point is good luck, right? Good luck. Because if you're not in the top point. 20% of women, you, statistically speaking, data-wise, you do not deserve this guy, this, this theoretical guy. So it turns out that modern female standards are incredibly high, like ridiculously high. And I'm not making this video to say that's a bad thing. I think all women should shoot for the highest quality guy they can convince to be with them. That's obviously what they should do. But um, they call this a delusion score for a reason on this website, right? Okay, so not to dwell on that too long, but I want to go back to, I promise we're going to get to how to find quality guys. It's really not hard. Um, even though they're that rare, uh, what you have many things going for you. One of them is information. If you're watching this video and you believe the things I'm saying, which I hope you do, because so far it's just been facts. Um, no one else is doing this, okay? So you're way ahead of the game. And yeah, these guys are super rare, but none of your female peers you're competing against. And I'm about to tell you how many you're competing against. None of them are doing this. So you, you've got a competitive edge. All right, so uh, what about the other way around? Before we go to scriptures, let's talk about the other way around. Well, like I said, there are... Male delusion scores too. So this website I found is called realitycalc.com. And I punched in, not married, no children, white women, between 5'2 and 6 foot, not overweight, and uh, what was the age range I punched in? 18 to 29, right? So remember, the guys it was point. Two, if you wanted to do the 20 to 30, 20 to 40, what did we say it was? 0.37 or something? So uh, I'd say baseline woman that's worth a decent guy's time. Again, the race thing will differ, but just because I think that reflects people. I think people have preference for certain races, but whatever. Um but the percentage is 7.95% of women in the US fit that, that standard, okay? So to put this another way, if you compare those two percentages, there are 21 women that fit the standards, baseline standards of a quality man. For every quality man, those 21 women would consider uh, sufficient baseline. So that is really, really lopsided. Okay, now, now we're gonna get in the scriptures. So a lot has been said about Isaiah 4, and I think a lot of it is wrong, but uh, that's not really the point of this video. Let's read this verse, Isaiah 4, 1, speaking at the end times, which if, doesn't, if this doesn't reflect today, it will reflect a time to be uh, shortly. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name. 
to take away our reproach. Now, there's a lot in this verse that has to do with a whole lot of things that are way outside the scope of this video. So I'm not by any means trying to say what I'm about to say, that's all there is to it. But um, we're just using this to kind of tie into the conversation. The point is a really long time ago, God told Isaiah enough that Isaiah wrote this, fully predicting that in our day or in a time shortly to come, because we're in the end times, there would be way more women for every man, ratio wise, and not necessarily talking about polygamy, set that aside, I'm just saying, a whole lot of women competing for very few men. I suggest that we are absolutely already there. This ratio is seven to one. The ratio I just showed you is 21 to one. Okay, but there's more. In Isaiah 13, verse 12, so just to give you a little, in case you don't know Isaiah, one of the many themes in Isaiah is that there will be a whole lot of changes in the end times, including wars and, and other things, um, other afflictions, that are vastly going to change the landscape of the human population. And um, this is all against that backdrop, but I'm not even talking about that. Because the United States has not been invaded by a foreign power. We had COVID, but we really haven't had plagues and famines yet. And although there are a whole lot more riots and things recently, um, I would say that we still haven't had any kind of serious civil unrest. And I do believe, and I have said, and I will say again, all of those things are absolutely coming. But that's not what this video is about. It's just about here and now. It will get worse. That's the thing is all these things are going to get worse. This ratio, this imbalance. But let's just talk about right now. So, so again, just to be plain, I'm quoting scriptures, but I'm not saying this is exactly what the scriptures referred to. I'm just kind of showing some parallels and we can leave it at that. We don't have to pin down the scripture to a specific fulfillment. I'm showing patterns. Okay, in Isaiah 13, 12, the Lord's speaking here, and he says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Now, that golden wedge of Ophir is a scriptural um, reference that pops up a couple of different times, but there was this place, and it had really high-quality gold, and there was a big chunk of gold that was well-known as this treasure of high value, Okay. So, um, it, it was high value because it was big, and it was high value because it was really high quality gold. It was very pure gold, the gold out of that region. So, when, when you read this, and this is the King James, and it says, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, then it would suggest that there was or will be or is a time when a man is not that precious, that a man is not regarded as valuable. So um, if you look up the, the Hebrew in this, that I will make more rare phrase, um, that is a word, uh, it's Strong's 3365, Yakar, I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's to be precious, prized, or praised. It's to, to be seen as something of value, okay? This is a really important theme, and again, I'm trying to pack a lot into this video, but... Um, this is a parallel to the idea of the phrase um, or the word sanctify. Sanctify or, or glorify. And I've talked about both these words before and, and I will again. But to sanctify or glorify something is to see it as having greater value than you saw before. Okay? And hopefully you're connecting some dots already. The rarity of quality men and quality women increases their apparent value, perceived value. Now they always had high value. Their actual value does not change because actual value is denoted in the eyes of God, not men. And there are a lot of scriptures that, that say that those two things are typically very different. In fact, they'll say things as strong as what is 
valuable in the eyes of men is abominable in the eyes of God and vice versa. And this is a, a false tradition a lot of people have. They assume that what is valuable in God's eyes will also be valuable in our eyes. It's, 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 uh, the normal thing is the opposite, okay? And so in our time, do you think that quality men are regarded as having value? I would say that if the standards of the average woman consider that men who are so rare that it's less than 1% of the U.S. population, male population, if they consider that average, so that would be 50% of the male population, if there's that much of a reduction, I think that would suggest a gross devaluation of men. And you could come back and say, yeah, but you did the man one, and that was like a little less than 8%. Yeah, well, it's still 21 times better, okay? But even if you make that, the, adjust that to the 50% mark, because of that huge ratio difference, it's still an enormous problem, okay? It's enormously lopsided right now. The value men have for women is 21 times higher than the value that women have for men, right? Even if you adjust the variables I put in there, it's still grossly disproportionate. And uh, I believe that we're not going to have to wait for wars, famine, and pestilence for people to get some people to, to get, some women to get, that it's off and it needs to go back. So that sounds like we're trying to change things. That's not my point. What I'm saying is there are already tons of young women out there who know that a good man is valuable. And I already said, there are a lot of good men who know that good women are extremely, extremely valuable. So how do we connect these two? That's the question, right? And my point with this video is I want to suggest that the way to do that is for good women to start pursuing good men. So historically, it was just like, wait around and a guy will find you. And very briefly, I've made the case that that can't happen anymore. So basically, you've got two options. One is you pray really hard and you hope that God is going to just send a miracle missile into your life of some random guy that somehow breaks through all these social barriers to find you and you don't find him creepy, right? Because for a guy to jump over those barriers, odds are it's going to flip your creepy alarm, okay? So let me give you some uh, tips here that are going to help you uh, to find those guys. I had two more scriptures, but whatever. All right, so as far as signs of uh, having light and truth or being holy and righteous for guys and for girls, there are a whole lot of these, and I have, I have found that people really don't know them. In fact, uh, I've spent some time writing about this, not publishing on it yet, but I think I have about 50 pages typed so far of just thing after thing that you can look for and identify these people. Now, if you're interested in that, let me know and maybe I can bump up the priority on that because there's a whole lot of things in my queue before that. Um, those pertain to a book that I don't think is gonna come out anytime soon and I'm trying to focus on the ones that are. So let me know in the comments if you wanna know those things because for men and women, those are things that um, everyone should work on and everyone ought to look for in uh, grading their associations, whether that be in romantic relationships or any other kind. But <clears throat> I want to tell you something that can give you something to use without all those specifics in the meantime. And that is that light cleaves to light. So the human population can be envisioned as a pyramid of people and at the top of the pyramid, this is actually not like this. It's way wider, okay? 
And as you go up in the pyramid, what you're doing is you're saying these people have more light, okay? And they're rare. Um, they're Pareto distributed, if you know what that means or care to look it up. But um, they do exist, and although they are rare, so quality men and quality women are really rare. But the good news is the things that make a man high quality will also make him more visible. Conversely, the things that make a woman higher quality will make her more invisible. And I'm going to qualify that. Don't get all crazy because I said that. Just wait. You can get crazy in a minute, but not yet. So if a woman is high quality, she's not going to be doing things that put herself out there. She's not going to be on Tinder. She's uh, not going to be working at the place that you work. So I'm speaking to quality men now. But, uh, you know, she's not going to be right there at your side in an oil field or something, right? Um, I'll leave it at that. We could dig in. And I, I don't want to make this long. And I don't want to throw up a bunch of things for people to get offended at that aren't the main thing which is going to be offensive enough, and that's fine. Um, so the things that make a woman a better wife and mother, they tend to be like, like quiet, non-public, more intimate, right? So she's going to be interested in being in a home. She's going to be interested in kids. She's going to be interested in not having tons and tons of male relationships, right? So the opposite of those things are huge red flags for high quality men. Because if a woman's like backpacking Europe every other month, odds are she's not going to be interested in, in switching that out. That's not just a placeholder for family life. She's into something else, right? And so on. So... Uh, if she has 100 male friends at any given moment, odds are she's not going to be like, oh, there's just a placeholder waiting for the right guy. Those are placeholders that prevent the real thing. They're not placeholders that prepare for the real thing. There's a huge difference. So when you get a job as a 16-year-old and you're digging trenches, that can prepare you for the real thing of not digging trenches for a living and making some real good money. But... Um, there are other things that they're not placeholders, they're, they're blockers. So, let's talk about a good man. So, a good, what makes a man a good husband and a good father is also going to lead to him being more prominent in society. Now, that can be for good or bad, right? That could be getting canceled, which, you know, I know a thing or two about. Um, or it could be getting awards, right? That I'm not just saying that society is going to laud this person. I'm saying they will be public. And why is that? Because a good man expands. A good man expands. And that's visible to people that don't know him. So, um, you know, I'm making YouTube videos. I've had a blog for over a decade now. I write books. Right. And none of those things have been my full time job. But in my full time job, I've published dozens of peer reviewed articles. I've won national awards that are really hard to get and grants. And so, um, you know, I got tenure. I got these awards doing things in my career that made me more visible. But my career was visible. I was teaching hundreds of students all the time. Right. I had dozens of people working for me in a lab. I have my own company. I have employees there. And so all of these things make men visible. Okay, so now here's the rub. The rub is that none of the things that make the guy more visible are socially acceptable ways of going on dates. So, um... Let's say that you did have a requirement of $85,000 plus a year. 
Well, you've probably never connected the dots, but that generates a list of careers that would work, right? Now, the question is, where do you find men who have those careers? So, for example, and left and right, people in tech are getting laid off today, so this isn't the best example, but they have these tech meetups all the time, and they're chock full of guys because disproportionately it's men who go into tech. So if you wanted to meet some guys, all you'd have to do is show up at one of these things. And most of the time they're free and they're publicized. You can find them in any state you're in. And uh, if you're wondering like, well, what would the icebreaker be there? It doesn't have to be anything. Like if you're part of something, just say you're coming as a part of that organization and you can get a cover story pretty easily without lying. Like if you're doing photography or you have a camera, <laughs> which if you have a phone, you have a camera, you could just say, I'm a photographer and I'm networking. And guys aren't gonna like interrogate, they don't care what your job is, right? And you'll probably get asked out on some dates if you just show up to something like that. You say, well, that's outside of my comfort zone. Okay, but then you're not a high quality woman because if you do value high quality men, that's a low bar. Like all you have to do is go to a free networking event where you're going to get free food anyway and alcohol if that's your thing and guys are going to hit on you. Like how is that a high bar? All right. So, but there are plenty of other things too. Like for example, um, have you ever considered getting a job as a bank teller? So, uh, I had this idea once, I, I have a credit union and it's small because I live in the middle of nowhere. And I was going in there all the time with checks for my business. And it was like, it was the same crew working there all the time. And they were all ladies. And so I got to know these ladies and we made jokes and stuff. And I usually went on a Friday, so it was like everybody's lighthearted. And one day I thought, uh, I thought and said before I could filter this because I felt comfortable and so I was like, I just kind of spoke without the filter. And I said, have any of you like checked guys' bank accounts and then hit on them if they were successful? And it was so funny because I think there were four ladies there. The one of them just owned it straight up. And I saw the look on her face was like, I do that all the time. The other lady also did it, I could tell. She turned bright red because she's like busted. The other two had this like, holy cow, that's a good idea. I've never thought of that look, right? The thing is, is working at a bank is a decent job. And if you're, there's a lot of turnover. If you're good at it, you're gonna get promoted. So what better way to hunt for men than get a job at a bank where you're, it's a career anyway? Right, so it's a pretty nice fallback. But in the meantime, if you if some customer comes in and he's relatively attractive, and he's not on a joint account, and he's got some money in his account, odds are you've narrowed the the you you've taken that point three seven or whatever, and you've made it like maybe a fifty percent chance that he's a halfway decent guy, which is an enormous explosion of probability. And again, you don't have to ask him out, right? But if you flirt with him a little, which is totally, oh, I don't work at a bank and I don't know the rules, but I'm pretty sure you could get away with an awful lot without crossing the line. So why wouldn't you do that, right? The worst thing that could happen is you get paid for a decent job. So what are you not going to do? You're not gonna go to Tinder. You're not gonna go to bars. And this one's gonna rub some feathers. So that's why I kind of saved it for last. You're not gonna go to college. This is really, really unpopular. But I'm telling you for guys and girls, and that's one reason I'm saying this, the reasons to go to college are so few today that you really ought to have a, a this is why it's different reason. There just aren't reasons. And so we could get into that. This video is already too long, but the point is you need alternative ways of meeting guys and you need to put yourself out there in ways that historically ladies didn't have to do. The good news is that the, and, and 
look, I just mentioned things like the networking thing that anybody could do that. The bank thing, that's a job. But there are things that have nothing to do with career that you can do because quality men put themselves out there. You just have to reach out to them. So it doesn't have to be weird or anything. And maybe I'll end with this. So this is a huge idea to pack into a little thing, but everybody has to stop thinking about relationships as this special thing. They are a special thing, but let me explain. Think about it like a garden. Your life is a garden and all the plants are people. Okay, and you're the gardener and your relationship is how you interact with these plants. And this is true, of, or should be true of everyone, whether they're looking for a romantic relationship or not. So bear with me for a second. You got all these plants and you grow the plants for fruit, right? In the, in the, in the most general sense. Um, grain, vegetables, it's all the produce of your garden is what you're after. And what's that produce? It's improvement. So you're on this planet to facilitate the improvement of others and also to use what they provide to the full extent to improve yourself as much as you can. That's the point. That's the fruit. So in some very special, so in the general case, you only have so much in terms of resources. So what you're going to do is you're going to scatter your seeds. You're going to treat all the ground the same until it starts to differentiate, right? When start, things start to sprout, you can see what you need to double down on. You can see the difference between some weeds and some not weeds early on. And other things like wheat and tares, they look the same for a really long time. You have to leave them alone unless you're my kids and you go out to weed and all of a sudden we don't have a corn plot anymore. So you let them grow together and you just keep doubling down on the stuff that works, right? Because what your goal is, is to maximize the improvement in yourself and in others through what you give. So uh, you go about it and you weed stuff and what you find is you're spending more and more resources, I did that the wrong way, more and more resources on fewer and fewer plants. That's what happens. And eventually you've got stuff dialed in really well so that the ratio of your energy to the fruit is really good. It's not like this, it's like this, right? You only have so much energy and you wanna maximize the fruit. Okay, so what does this have to do with relationships? What I just described, in my opinion, is what everyone should be doing all the time. Relation, romantic relationships are a special case where a plant fits certain criteria where you're going to give the mother load of attention to it. It's going to rise in prominence to your highest priority in the garden. And there are rules for this, right? So, um, like you're not going to enter, if you're a young person, you're not gonna enter into a relationship with someone who's 85, they're off the list. Or, um, you know, this is like, we could get into details, but like everyone has a little box and it's like inside of that box, that's what I'm looking for, right? But you don't start there. You start with the garden. And within that garden, there will be certain things that are uh, certain people who are uh, possibilities in that res respect. But don't just prioritize, don't just elevate them to that priority. They should jump through the hoops just like everybody else, which sounds terrible. But the point is you scale your effort. You don't just say like, oh, I have a girlfriend, I have a boyfriend, I dial this up to 10 and let's go, right? You, you, it's all an informational pyramid and they have to scale it, right? And you do too in their world. <sighs> anyway, I, I wasn't going to go into all that. Let's cut this off here, but I hope you find this, this uh, useful. And again, my takeaway here, intended takeaway, is that quality women have to start learning to approach quality men. The reason is, because quality men are, reasons are, quality men are super rare, and so are quality women. But unlike quality women, 
quality men give public signs. And so the women have to initiate that contact and take it the first step of the pyramid, not all the way, and then guys can respond. Women have to provide guys opportunities to respond today because the, his, the historic ways are closed and they're not gonna come back until a lot of things change. So if you're a quality woman and what you want out of life is a family and a home and children and a husband that you can actually be devoted to without regretting it, then you're going to have to find that guy. He's not going to have a way to find you. So that's the takeaway from this video and I hope it's useful.